time I have my depression, my family says to me, uh, uh, my mom says to me, uh, we have a Danish uh, song called uh, Travel you up and get wiser. <laughs> and my mother said to me, listen to it. And the text is so good. <laughs> oh, good. But, but, um, but um, the second time, I have many depressions, but the second time, my family, uh, um, it's more, it gets more easier to take care of me. Yeah. Because they know how yeah. I was so... And it may take, it might be easier for you to take care of yourself too, if you know what you are uh, experiencing. Yeah. Yeah, because I've found uh, the more times I experienced these states, um, the better I got at looking after myself in them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. Thank you. So, anyway, the one that we get all the time uh, is drugs, okay? But um, there are many other things we need. Now, the, this is what, in a recovery-based service, we should have, uh, we sh these things should be as available as the drugs are now. So, um, someone to help us navigate our, our way around a complex system, okay? Peer support, uh, which I talked about this morning. Recovery education, that is having help to learn how to deal with life. Um, personal support, it might be uh, just day-to-day -day personal support. Personal support in a crisis. Um, support in education, employment and housing. Uh, different sorts of therapies and advocacy. Now imagine if we had a system where we could get all those things as reliably as we get the drugs now. It would be very different, wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay, so uh, move, uh, next slide. Then um, uh, we're going further up the system. I'm not going to spend too much time, but we have responses to populations uh, in a recovery-based system. The most important one is that actually in a recovery-based system, we need, it needs to be supported by an anti-discrimination program, okay? And I'll be talking a bit more about that in a minute. So, uh, next slide. Um, intersectoral responses, well, this vexes everyone, but we need ways of working together between services and between sectors. Because if we want help with employment, education, housing, uh, and all those things. Uh, we need other parts of this, uh, other, other sectors involved. Next slide. And the systemic framework. So if we want a recovery-based system, we need a systemic framework where um, the lived experience is evident in the way we do policy, funding, uh, the way we do research, um, and in, in workforce development, uh, having new workforces like peer support workers and um, having uh, service users and that lived experience perspective in the oversight of the whole system. Okay, next slide. So, any questions about that? Um, may I return to something earlier? Yep. About the uh, No Mental Health yes, Act. Yes, yep. I think that what you said about not having legislation for certain groups is a very valid point, and I think it's uh, worth considering. But I'm a bit concerned about if you have the option to decline treatment, sometimes when people are really sick, there's a, um, the emotional suffering is yeah. very high, yeah. and that I, I would worry, be worried about people always having the um, always being able to say no to 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 treatment because right. of that. Because of uh, the they they are suffering uh, so much. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think there are, there, are, there are several ways of dealing with this. I mean, one is, if we routinely had advanced directives, uh, you know advanced directives? Where, or a, a, an advanced directive is a statement that you make which says to people, uh, when you're feeling, when you're feeling uh, good uh, and competent, it is a statement you make which says, this is what I want to happen to me uh, and this is what I don't want to happen to me when I have a crisis. Okay. Um, sometimes, uh, now I, I'm not saying that we should never ever, ever uh, have people in a safe place or we should never ever treat people when they don't consent. Because that doesn't happen in physical health. If someone is unable to communicate or they are unconscious, we, we treat without their consent. So there, there needs to be a little bit of flexibility uh, about that. Uh, but uh, this should be very rare. It should happen hardly ever, and it should be very brief, and it should only be in the gravest emergency. That is my view. Now, uh, if someone is suffering very badly, and they say, I don't want treatment. Um, we should have more in our toolbox, more, more, you know, in our tools, more tools than just the drugs. We have got so used to thinking, someone is in pain, I will give them a drug. When in fact, there are many other ways that we can help people to reduce their, their level of pain, okay? So I think uh, we need to think much more about what are other ways that we can help to reduce the level of pain. Um, because I think very often there are other ways of, of doing that. And I know for myself, some very simple things help to reduce my pain. Uh, one was physical touch. Well, that was pretty simple. You know, so, so for some people it would not be physical touch, that, that would be wor make things worse for them. So, so, um, so that is my response. I don't know if that's uh, satisfactory, uh, but yeah. yeah. Thank you for the question. Any other questions before we go on? Okay. Now, so I've done a very, uh, a, a kind of an outline of uh, what might be going on in a recovery-based system. And now, then people said to me, well, how do we get there? It all sounds very good, but how, how on earth do we get there? So I, th I had to scratch my head and say, oh dear, I better think about that. So I came up with seven pathways to a recovery-based system. And um, how much time have we got? 12 more minutes. 12 more minutes. I'll have to really speed through this. So, the first pathway. Oh, no, no, get it. I showed that one this morning. Um, so, here they are build peer leadership, reduce coercion, close institutions, create new core services, enable system recovery reduce stigma and discrimination, and reduce social determinants. So they're the seven pathways. So I want to go on to pathway one. Now, um, we need a system that where peers or people with lived experience are leaders at all levels, uh, in all kinds of roles, um, and um, we also need a peer workforce, okay? But not just... Uh, when I say all sorts of roles, they could be managers or psychiatrists. They don't have to be, uh, don't have to be peer specific roles. Um, and, uh, you know, I was, a I was at a very senior level in the New Zealand government for a few years. And, um, and uh, I was amazed at uh, the power of position. You know, if you're one of the bosses, I'd, 
I didn't know this until I got this job because I was used to people not listening to me. Now, when I got this job, I said exactly the same things as I'd always said. Oh, there were complaints from the nurses and the psychiatrists and all sorts of people. Um, and, I mean, they didn't all complain, but some of them did. And that was because of the... This is stupid, I know, but position uh, gives you power and influence. And we need, uh, we need people with lived experience in these positions. Yeah, OK. So, next slide. Um, reduce coercion. Now, I think it should almost be eliminated, coercion of all sorts, as I've said. But um, we need to offer everyone recovery education so they can uh, avoid crises, OK? Uh, advanced directives. Now, you hear, heard me talk about them uh, before. Um, well, if we offered more choices to people in crisis, we wouldn't have to, we may not feel so tempted to, uh, to put the Mental Health Act onto them. Because if all you have is pills and pillows to offer, uh, if you had other things to offer, maybe people would want to come into the service. Okay? Um, eliminate seclusion. You call it seclusion in Denmark? Uh, isolation. Isolation solitary confinement, and uh, unlock acute wards. I don't know if your wards are locked, but in New Zealand we lock them to, you know, and then uh, lobby against special mental health legislation. Right, next slide. Um, we need to, uh, now, you, I'm glad you don't have long stay hospitals, but actually um, we need to uh, really reduce a lot the, the acute hospital beds um, and replace them with community-based alternatives. Crisis houses, home-based treatment. Okay, next slide. Um, create new core services. We've talked about these services, but there needs to be a plan uh, that, to, that, that creates uh, core services such as these uh, if we're going to have a recovery-based system. Next slide. Uh, enable system recovery. Now, I think uh, in many parts of the world, uh, we, uh, in, uh, for instance, in, in England, there is a woman who is saying, we need truth and reconciliation in psychiatry. Do you know what that means? They had this in South Africa after apartheid. They had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission where people could go and say, yes, I did these terrible things, but they would not be, um, uh, they would not be charged with anything. Well, I think we need this for psychiatry because psychiatry, there have been many good people in psychiatry. There have been good things done, but there has also been a lot of harm done by psychiatry. And how can we move to a recovery-based system unless we openly acknowledge the harm that was done and is still being done. Um, now, uh, and we need uh, the system. It's not just the individuals who use the services, but the people in the system that need recovery, the people who are part of that system, who may have to get over the shame of what they were part of or who, who may have to learn new skills. Um, and so we need to heal the system and the individuals uh, as a parallel process. Uh, next slide. And then um, reducing stigma and discrimination. Do you have anti-discrimination uh, in Denmark? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Now, is it based on human rights or the need to, for treatment? Because the discrimination programs should be based on our, uh, on our rights to be equal citizens, not on the need for us to get into treatment. Now, there's a lot of research that suggests uh, that we should be doing the human rights end and not the treatment end. Um, we need to target attitudes, behaviour and legislation. Um, 
It needs to tackle discrimination, not just in society, but in our helping systems, and it needs to go for a long time. We've had one going for about 14 years in New Zealand, and we need it for another 14 years. And, uh, next one. And of course, um, we need to work at the source of the problem, which is why uh, people get into the mental health services in the first place. And there are many well-known social determinants of mental distress, such as um, childhood trauma, uh, income inequality, which you do not suffer from too much in Denmark, which is good, and uh, uh, racism and other forms of marginalisation. So next slide. Oh, just to finish, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And the next slide. So just do it. So that's it from, uh, that's my bit. And now we have a few minutes for questions, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, have you got a mic? Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I came in in the middle of it, so I'm sorry if I'm missing out something. But you don't approve uh, being in hospital too long. Okay, because yeah. for me, it has saved my life. Right. I, I went to uh, St. Hans Hospital in an, an, an department where it was made totally only for uh, my diagnosis. Yep. And I stayed there for two years and it saved my life. Right, okay. And they have closed that down now and I think that's yeah. a disaster. Yeah, yeah. What was it about it that I mean, did it save your life because it was a hospital or because it was a special place that you could go? <laughs> because they were working uh, towards my diagnosis. Yeah, All yeah. of us, we were like 14 young people there. Yeah. And, um, How many 14? 14, yeah, living well, in that house. In a and house? We, in a house, yeah, yeah. yeah in some oh. hands. Oh, look, I, I don't, I'm not saying uh, 14 people in a house doesn't sound like a hospital to me. Um, what I'm saying is that uh, um, there are, you know, in many parts of the world, there are still large hospitals with hundreds of people in them who are just left there year after year after year. Okay, I don't yeah. approve that. Yeah, yeah. But and even for most people who are in a crisis, going into uh, a ward where there are 20, 30, 50, 100 people uh, doesn't work very well. But if you are in a setting with 14 people and um, it was a nice uh, home type setting, uh, then, then uh, that is not a really a hospital as as I it, see it. It was very much a hospital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But still well, um, what, was it a, was it a part of a, a hospital or? Uh, Saint Hans was once yeah. uh, a huge area in oh. Roskilde where there's loads of apartments, yeah. departments. Uh, look, if you say it was helpful to you, I believe you. When you look at the research, uh, and, and it sounds like it was a very special place. When you look at the research about standard hospital treatment, uh, you get a very different picture. You, you get people, and I don't know if you've had another experience of hospital where I it have. was bad. So, uh, and then, then we have to tease out, well, what was it about your good experience that was good, and what, well, how was that different from the bad experience? Have you thought about that? Yeah. Yeah, what, <laughs> what would you say? Um, when I was in St. Hans those two years, they were working directly on my dis, uh, illness. Yeah. And um, that helped me yeah. because they had space for me, they had yeah. time for me. Yeah, yeah. And they met me where I was, yeah. which heal healed me. Yeah. Uh, I've been to other places, I've been to Rishospital in Hvidov and other places where I was uh, sleeping in the hall. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, or sleeping with loads of people in the yeah, same yeah. room. That didn't help at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. So there again, um, a place you can go where you get plenty of uh, time from people is, is very important. And unfortunately, a busy, acute 
ward in a hospital or a, a, a rehabilitation ward, often they, they don't. There's a culture almost that says, oh, we don't want to spend time with people. Yep. Okay. Any other uh, questions? I think it's um, uh, maybe a very important issue, also connecting to your uh, question uh, that you didn't uh, have the same meaning uh, about uh, this kind of treatment. I think the key word could be treatment. How do we uh, understand this word? It's very narrow in Denmark, uh, very narrow. And when we say treatment, we think we think the same. And when you talk about treatment and the possibilities, it's, it's a huge difference. And uh, when you talk about what you have been through, uh, it also sounds a very human and nice environment you have been, where somebody listened to you and understood you. So that's also a different kind of treatment. Yeah. Well, um, yes. Uh, tr well, in English, treatment is a medical word um, and we, when we think about treatment, we've, we really think about drugs and uh, maybe psychotherapy. It's therapeutic treatment. Uh, but uh, as I said, in a recovery-based system, you need a lot more than just the therapies. You need um, a whole lot of things. So, uh, yeah, so it's getting beyond just treatment in that narrow sense is very important. So you think uh, in 10 years we don't have the word treatment but recovery-based uh, activities or...? Well, um, could it replace I, don't, it? I don't use the word treatment. I don't know if I used it much, but no. I tend not to use it, no. No. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any further questions? What's the time? Is it time to... Um, I think we have one or two minutes left. We two more minutes. Two more minutes. So now's your chance. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to know how well... Um, what do you call it? Is it a, um, a great part of your system now, the recovery-based system in New Zealand? Or is it like here? or? What is like the status now? Oh, in New Zealand? Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, it is not like I described it in, okay. in New Zealand. In fact, there is no country in the world that I would say has a recovery-based system. There are pockets, there are small parts in countries that have a much more recovery-based system, but not a whole country. But one thing New Zealand did do was it um, closed down the hospitals. And um, uh, you find in countries like the Netherlands, uh, England, Australia, parts of America, there are still a lot of people uh, in hospitals. And... Um, uh, that is the first thing you need to do if you want to create a recovery-based system, is um, not to have people languishing in hospitals. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, it's not actually a question, it's more like a comment. I was just uh, thinking about the word treatment yeah. Treatment, it's, uh, when I hear the word treatment, I think it's something that is done to you. You are being treated. Yeah. And that's kind of the opposite uh, to recovery. That's yeah. kind of the process uh, from the individual yeah. point of view. So, just an observation. Yeah, I, I think that's quite true. That's probably, I mean, that's probably why I, I am a little bit reluctant to use it because. While uh, I'm not, you know, I think um, the, the drugs and the therapies can help some people um, if they're used carefully, uh, but um, it's not a term that really fits with uh, 
my philosophy very easily. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mary. Let's give her a big hand. Og så er der øh, kaffepause med frugt og chokolade, og det foregår op i forjen, og så er vi øh, tilbage igen her, når klokken er kvart over tre. Tre ting. Det er fremragende, det er nytænkning, og det kan løse en hel masse problemer, ikke kun inden for psykiatrien, men også med hensyn til børn og unge. Hva? Ja, det, det skal jeg nok fortælle. Altså, Hækkerup, ministeren Hækkerup, hun er begyndt at forstå noget af de ting der med, at dem, der ender i psykiatrien, det er ofte børn, der på en eller anden måde har været udsat. Ikke? Og det sætter sig. En hver forstår en, en traumatisk, en posttraumatisk ting, hvis man har været i krig og så videre. Men det er nogle helt andre små ting, der skaber de skrøbeligheder. Og det skal der være tid til også at snakke om. Jamen, jeg synes, det er åbenlys, øh, let organiseringen af en psykiatrisk behandlingsindsats tilgang. At øh, inddrage netværket øh, patientens syn og meninger og tanker fra begyndelsen. Fordi det påvirker hele situationen fra starten. Og hvis vi ikke inkluderer dem, så går situationen og udvikler sig nemt til noget andet. Og så inkluderer vi dem først, først i den sidste ende, og så sker der noget nyt igen. Og, øh, det er ikke os, der skal vide. Det er os, der skal være med til at hjælpe folk på vejen og støtte dem i en svær situation. Så lytte og lad dem fortælle og lad dem blive klogere på det, hvad de går igennem med vores støtte og hjælp. Er det, er det, er det ikke også, at man flytter fokus fra, at det er et individ, der er til at fokus, at det er patienten, der har det problem med til, at, 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 at både løsning og problemer kan ligge i netværket? Eller hvad? Jamen, der er ikke nødvendigvis noget, 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 der skal identificeres som et problem. Det er noget, der sker, og noget folk gør. Og det er mere, hvorfor gør de, hvorfor gør de det, de gør? De har ofte gode forklaringer på det. Og får en meget bredere forståelse for den situation, som ofte defineres som problem. Hvad, hvad har det betydet for dig at begynde at arbejde på den tilgang? Hvad har det betydet for dig? Det har betydet for mig, at jeg blev i psykiatrien helt personligt. Jeg var ellers på vej ud for 12 år siden. Fordi jeg synes ikke om den psykiatri, jeg mødte. Jeg kunne ikke, øh, jeg, eller det var ikke noget, jeg kunne ikke finde mig selv i den. Og når jeg så hørte om det her, så synes jeg, det begyndte at give faglig mening også. Øh, jeg så ikke mig selv som i den der sygeplejerske rolle, at jeg ved, hvad der er bedst for dig. Og når jeg mødte den her tilgang, så åbnede der sig en ny dør for mig. Og jeg tror, det er en rigtig stor udfordring for mange fagfolk. Og øh, træde ned fra den der kasse, som Claus snakkede om. Nede på pedestalen? Ja, og, og være i øjenhøjde, og øh, det forpligter på en anden måde. Du er med, du er ikke uden for en situation og observerer det, der sker, men du er midt i det samme med patienten og netværket. Men Claus gjorde også noget rigtig smart. Hvad ja. der var, han sagde, da han gik med? Så sagde han. Ja, sådan her, tror jeg, han sagde. Nej, han sagde, jamen øh, min faglighed følger med. Ja, det gør den da. Det er klart. Den bliver jo ikke et eller andet sted deroppe. Hvis du hører, at faggruppen har det svært med den her tilgang, hvad kunne det så være der? Hvad siger du så? Der Jamen, jeg tænker, det er bredt, fordi vi er uddannet til noget andet. Vi er uddannet til at analysere. Vi er uddannet ud fra at skulle holde os neutrale og se på en situation, definere problemer, komme med løsninger. Så det er jo en helt anden tilgang, der skal til i vores uddannelser til det, hvis vi skal have det netværksbaserede dialogbaseret. Ikke fordi vi skal kassere noget. Ikke fordi vi skal ikke bruge det, vi kan. Vi skal ikke kaste vold på noget. Hvad siger du? Man skal ikke kaste vold på noget. Men man skal ikke aflære noget. Man skal omstille sig til nogle nye vilkår og en, en, en ny tid.